Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2011 commencement ceremony of the Paul H. Nitsi School of Advanced International Studies, the Johns Hopkins University. Ladies and gentlemen, the faculty of the Paul H. Nitsi School of Advanced International Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2011 graduating class of the Paul H. Nitsi School of Advanced International Studies.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the national anthem. What a wonderful entry. And I'm Jessica Einhorn, the Dean of Science. So to Ms. Josette Sheeran, our esteemed graduation speaker, to our science faculty and staff, other honored guests, and especially members of the class of 2011, and your families and friends, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the commencement of the Paul H. Schnitze School of Advanced International Studies size to us of the Johns Hopkins University. Today, we celebrate the graduation of the class of 2011 as you embark on careers of leadership in the international sphere. We congratulate you on receiving your size graduate degree and on the vision, dedication, and hard work that helped you achieve this major milestone in your lives. Many of you are at heart adventurers. You've traveled the world and witnessed its dynamism and diversity, as well as its despair and even violence. Your determination to leave the world a better place is what brought you to SAIS. In 2011, we find ourselves facing great global challenges as new global powers emerge, Middle East countries move from revolution to political order, the global economy struggles to grow and rebalance, and demography portends great challenges in many parts of the world. Trained, intelligent leaders are more essential than ever. With your understanding of economics, your knowledge of regions and the modern disciplines of international affairs, your expertise in languages, and an education that has combined theory with practical training, we are confident that each one of you is more than ready to lead. As many of you know, I was also once a student at SAIS. The school was much smaller, but one thing has endured, a commitment to international engagement. Looking back at my experience as a graduate student, it was paradoxically in the classroom itself that I learned to look beyond. Our faculty is this school's beating heart. They share a love of teaching and a firm belief that real life experience is the ongoing laboratory for theory. This rare blend of world engagement and scholarship is what sets them apart. As we honor you, the 67th class to graduate from this unique institution, it is appropriate to remind ourselves of the SAIS mission, which is to prepare future generations of leaders to help shape a better world. At the end of this commencement, the students will present the Max M. Fisher Excellence in Teaching Award. While we single out a single professor at this time, we are mindful of the enormous contribution 
of the 72 full-time faculty and close to 140 part-time faculty who enrich our school while helping our students understand the world outside its doors. A special welcome this year to Professor David Girard, who joined us for this first commitment. I thank him for his excellent leadership of our program in energy, resources, and environment. Our faculty has made SICE a center of scholarship in international affairs. As we search for answers to formidable global issues, our work is strengthened by our affiliation with the prestigious Johns Hopkins University, the first research university of the United States. For our students, our partnerships with other universities has allowed 22 members of this class of 2011 to pursue dual degrees in business, in law, and in public health. In choosing size, I know that many of you were drawn to our Washington, D.C. location and the city's rich academic and professional challenges. Our wonderful triangle of campuses in Bologna, Italy, in Nanjing, China, and Washington makes us a truly international school. And today, we are indeed fortunate to have Dr. Kenneth Keller, the director of our Bologna Center, with us. We'd like to extend to him a warm welcome. His work and our international campuses allow our students to gain a first-hand knowledge of world affairs from other cultural perspectives. I would add that we are also international in our diverse student body, which represents more than 55 countries. But today we come together united in one purpose, and that is to honor and celebrate the graduating class. Each science class has its own personality and character, its own legacy, and we all loved the class of 2011. You reached out beyond your books and the classroom. <laughs> reached out beyond your books and the classroom to educate yourselves in the fullest sense of the world and to further SICE's mission. During the school year, you took trips that spanned the globe. You took opportunities to travel with learning for on-site study well beyond your classrooms. Conflict management students went to see conflict in the Philippines. Students from several programs outside of Asia took trips to China. Our international law students traveled to Sri Lanka, and strategic study students participated in their staff ride in France. Indeed, SAI students are actually always on the move, as no doubt their family knows with practicums, regional trips, and your own remarkable personal adventures. 28 outstanding members of this class were chosen as finalists in the Presidential Management Fellowship Program, and nine of you were offered Boren Fellowships to study and research in areas of the world that are critical to U.S. interests. In addition to the awards and accolades, you stretched your intellectual muscles as journalists and scholars writing and editing the SICE Observer, the scholarly SICE Review, and SICE Perspectives. And as if that were not enough, while tackling a rigorous course load, many of you interned in the public and private sectors across the city and around the world. Working with the Student Government Association, Career Services, and the Office of Student Life, 37 career, regional, and activity clubs played an important role in SICE by hosting a variety of innovative programs and events. Career clubs are an integral part of the SICE experience. This year, 12 clubs hosted over 100 programs with over 1,500 attendees. The 2011 recipients of the career club leadership this year went to Careers in Development Club, which is good for our speaker. Again and again, when I asked what made this class so distinctive, I was told strong student leadership across the school in programs and activities. I would like to express particular appreciation to members of the Student Government Association, led by SGA President Sean Healy, who worked throughout the year on behalf of all of us. To all of our club and other leaders, your initiative and encouragement help make this past academic year the great success we all enjoyed. 
Our whole community carries special memories which will linger for years. We had many happy moments, but we also had two tragedies, one so personal and one for the planet to take notice. In our community, we began the year with the tragic loss of Julia Bachliner, whose memory will be honored later in this event. But we also came together to express our solidarity and provide support to the victims of the ferocious earthquake and tsunami in Japan. Ambassador Fujichaki came to SAIS to poignantly express his appreciation for the links between his country and the United States as seen in this hour of need. Last year, your first, was the year of religion, and this was the year of demography at SAIS. Throughout the year and around the school, we learned how demographic trends can create challenges around the world and thus become a palpable force in international affairs. At school-wide events this year, students and other guests heard from prominent figures across a wide array of topics. We opened the year with Secretary Hillary Clinton speaking to us on international health. And as we neared the close, Joint Chiefs, uh, Joint Chiefs Chairman Admiral Mullen addressed us in the annual Rostov Lecture. In between, we had literally hundreds of events on campus as scholars and leaders from the private, public, and nonprofit sectors came to size for events large and small to speak with us about international affairs. We salute our SAIS students who study, travel, hold internships, choose amongst 500 events and speakers at the school, engage in public service, and find time to party together and participate in the culture of our city. You honored that SAIS tradition of having fun at the Mr. and Mrs. Seiss competition, the Cherry Blossom Ball, the International Dinner, Seiss Palooza, and of course, your Friday happy hours. But now it's late May when we celebrate the most significant event for us of all, the conferring of degrees. You are leaving Seiss, as they say, to begin a new chapter, and it's true, in your lives of international engagement. Today, you, the class of 2011, Join the family of SAIS alumni, an extraordinary group of individuals who hold positions of leadership in government, academia, business, journalism, and nonprofit profit organizations in this country and around the world. We also owe much to our extended family of friends and contributors, some of whom are here today. And I want to particularly acknowledge our staff who are all around us today making this beautiful event happen, and who, working with our associate deans, provide support as well as a human touch to every aspect of life at SAIS. Thank you for all that you do. And most importantly now, I want to honor the family and friends of our graduates. As you can see, we have truly enjoyed your children and loved ones. They are adventuresome, idealistic, and caring people. We had the privilege of guiding them for two years, while many of you made sacrifices to keep them here. Your love, your support, and your patience have made this day possible. You are our most honored guests, and you deserve our applause. Now, a final word to the class of 2011. As you graduate and move into professional lives across the wide spectrum of international relations, I can't help but wonder how each of you will, in one way or another, help shape and reshape the world as countries, institutions, and individuals adjust to changing realities. There is so much to be done. I trust that with leaders like you engaging in international affairs, we can look to future with opportunities for peace and prosperity across the globe. We are happy and proud to send you into your chosen areas of professional life. Great hopes go with you, and I know you will live up to them. Thank you.
now I come to a very special treat. The students decide who our commencement speaker should be, and I have the privilege of introducing her. It is a great personal honor to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Josette Sheeran became the 11th Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Program in April 2007. As leader of WFP, as it's known, Ms. Sheeran oversees the world's largest humanitarian agency, which each year gives food to an average of 90 million people in at least 80 of the world's poorest countries. WFP reaches out to hungry people who cannot help themselves, with a special emphasis on women and girls who suffer disproportionately from hunger and malnutrition. WFP and recipients include victims of war and natural disasters, orphans and families affected by AIDS and HIV, and school children in poor communities. Secretary General Kofi Annan, prior to the present uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, appointed Ms. Sheeran to this crucial leadership position, having seen her service on the high-level UN panel on system-wide coherence in the areas of development, humanitarian assistance, and the environment. Through that work, Ms. Sheeran knew, before she entered the job, that she was becoming the leader of a precious gem in the UN system on whose uh, work so many of the poorest and most vulnerable people's lives depend. She's well prepared for an additional present assignment where she's chair for a two-year term of the High-Level Committee on Management, which oversees the management and administrative system of the UN. As our SICE graduates know, preparation makes all the difference in achieving success, and Josette Sheeran is as well prepared as one can be for her daunting responsibilities at WFP. She's worked in the public and private sectors, both managing and engaging in diplomacy. Before the UN, she served as undersecretary in the State Department for Economic, Energy, and Agricultural Affairs in the United States Department of State. She was responsible for a broad array of economic issues, including development, trade, agriculture, finance, energy, and more. Before State, Ms. Sheeran served as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative, a very important job in the United States, in the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. There, she advanced the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which helps African culture, countries develop the trade capacity so that they can successfully compete in international markets. She was responsible for negotiations in both Asia and Africa. Ms. Sheeran has a 20-year proven track record as a management leader, including overseeing the U.S. Department of State's Economic Diplomatic Corps of 2000. And before that STR job, she was managing director of Starpoint Solutions, a leading Wall Street technology firm that works with many large companies. She also served as the president and CEO of Empower America, a Washington, D.C. think tank where she advanced the agenda of economic empowerment for our inner cities as well as developing nations. Public leadership requires skill in communication and understanding public accountability. As managing editor of a major newspaper, a frequent commentator on television news, and as a Pulitzer Prize juror, including for foreign reporting, Ms. Sheeran can count on her own intuition to serve so well in guiding the rest of us through a global crisis in the realm of food security. Global citizens need to have roots in their own communities, and our speaker reached out to her own community by serving on Washington boards of the Urban League, the United Negro College Fund, and other organizations. For our students at SICE, gender is almost incidental as a characteristic of leadership. Our women and men are trained together with no limits set by gender to their ambitions or their achievements. But I am of a generation that till still takes a special joy in calling to the podium a woman who has accomplished so much since she graduated from the University of Colorado in 1976, earning so many friends and so much admiration along the way. Often, I say that our students will have careers of many parts, ranging across their paid work in the public, private, nonprofit, or journalism sectors, and their volunteer work in their communities and with internationally active nonprofits. As you all set out on this next stage of your careers, 
I think you have chosen for us an excellent speaker for our commencement. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the podium Josette Sheeran. Hello, class of 2011. We can feel your pride in the room. Dean Einhorn, distinguished faculty, proud parents, grandparents, friends, future leaders, that's you. It's an honor to be chosen by you to present this commencement address. As you know, and as mentioned, I'm blessed to be head of the World Food Program, a remarkable institution created 50 years ago on the foundation of the Marshall Plan, upon the ashes of a war-torn Europe where many faced starvation. From that experience, both Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy shared the belief that peace cannot be built on an empty stomach. This is no less true today, where the abject frustration of Mohammed Bouazizi, a vegetable seller whose self-immolation lit a, a flame across the world, fueled by the frustrations of, hard of the hardworking who have been entrapped in abjectly disabling environments. As a graduate of SAIS, you will inherit the mantle passed down by founders Paul Nitze and Christian Herter, who also recognized that the post-World War II world would require a new generation of diplomats, policymakers, and leaders with a new set of political and economic skills. Boy, were they visionaries. And Dean Einhorn, under your leadership, this dream is being fulfilled. I think even Christian Herter and Paul Nitze would be astounded by the global reach of this class. You come from 50 different countries representing a array of cultural, religious, and ethnic fabric of our world. And look at all these fabulous women. Congratulations. Just yesterday, I was on the hallowed seventh floor of the US State Department in the Secretary of State's office, meeting with her leadership team on Haiti, food security, and tackling the global food crisis. When I mentioned that I'd be at SAIS today, hands went up around the table. I'm a SAIS graduate, me too, me too. Bologna, what year, what year? What concentration? It was true also when I was a leader at USTR in the trade office and in the global economic diplomacy of state. I came to rely on SAIS graduates, always distinguished by very practical training in global leadership. Indeed, 14 members of my WFP leadership team are SAIS alumni. Your brand, indeed your tribe, is special. And I'm very proud my daughter, Nicole Shiner, is a SAISer too. Today, I can only imagine your many emotions, but I think I can feel your anticipation to go from the classroom back into action, from a listener to a leader. I know that reaching this milestone was perhaps not easy. It was built upon countless nights spent studying rather than sleeping or partying, weekends writing papers, and perhaps an accumulated 20 years or more of classes, homework assignments, hard work, and financial investment. It was also built on the efforts of those who came before you. In many cases, you may be the first in your family to earn a master's degree or even a college degree. Some in this room, your parents and grandparents, may have been denied the opportunity because of the color of their skin or because they were women or because they were raised in such severe poverty or in conflict zones, and they had to struggle just to survive. Yes, you are among the elite, among the luckiest of all of human history. 
Even today, less than 7% of the people in the world have a college degree of any kind. There is a story behind each of you of someone who believed in you, invested in you, perhaps a parent or a grandparent. Raise your hands. Where are the parents and the grandparents? So many of you. <laughs> This is your degree, too. <laughs> yes, I heard it. <laughs> Perhaps some had to leave their homeland to give you the dream that they would have wanted in their own life. Now that you have completed your language proficiency examination, I know the favorite part for many of you, core exams, you're just one hopefully brief speech away from being handed your degree, and the inevitable question, is what comes next. Perhaps no other class since the founding of SICE has stepped out into a world of greater change, of even hyper-change. Just the past 20 weeks have unleashed a transformative revolution sweeping away old structures, old mindsets, old certainties, and old moorings. Yes, we have reached a tipping point. The geopolitical puzzle pieces have been thrown up in the air. They are tumbling back to Earth and will begin to create new formations. How will they come together? Will the new formations advance the aspirations, needs, and dignity of our world? Will it be more, a more equitable world of opportunity? Will it be a world tapping the talents of us all? Women, the marginalized, the oppressed, the hungry. Who will lead? What does it take to be a leader in a world where revolution is spread overnight via social media and risk is the new normal? What are the qualities that a leader must possess to guide constructive transformation in a flattened world? You are being launched into a world of questions. As Malcolm Gladwell outlined in his book, The Tipping Point, ideas can spread like epidemics. Yet today, we have tipping points in search of leadership. The expectations of leadership are changing as fast as the Arab Spring is blooming. Many world leaders must be saying, who moved my cheese? As the classic management book from the 90s put it. What worked in leadership even a few months ago is now considered hopelessly out of date, old style. Many of you have yet, many, who have yet to have even moved to email are no doubt demanding of their staffs or maybe of their 12-year-olds, what is Twitter? What is Facebook? You have all studied the traits of leadership and been exposed to leaders. I would like to highlight what I see as the essential non-negotiable elements of leadership in this era of hyperconnectedness. And perhaps you will add a few of them to your backpacks and briefcases as you go forward. First, I believe we're in an era where we will see the end of the boss, quote unquote. Your generation is turning the leadership pyramid where power is retained in an ever narrowing, distinct top structure upside down. Lesson number one is do not wait to be appointed boss to be a leader. For the millennia, the world has operated under a leadership model based on exclusivity, exclusive access to knowledge, to power, to bloodlines. One was able to lead and indeed control through exclusive access to information and exclusive access to power net powerful networks. All of that has changed in an era where information is a commodity and power networks can be formed virtually overnight from the bottom up. I was struck by this change when I stood on the border of Libya in a sea of 40,000 people who had just poured over the border. Frankly, even the humanitarians were caught behind the wave. There was no formal access to food, shelter, or water. The leaders of the Tulip Revolution, using Twitter and Facebook, had formed one of the most amazing citizen supply chains. Cars of bread, yogurt, Every type of food were pouring in, blankets. And I stood there, the first leader from the UN to be there. 
and BBC wanted an interview. They were on deadline, and they said, you must talk to us right now. And one of the leaders of the Tulip Revolution put his hand on my arm gently, and he said, you must talk to us first before you talk to the world. And the BBC correspondent said, but my deadline, in 30 seconds, this has to go. And he said, this is our revolution. You will talk to us first. And then he told me they were overwhelmed and they needed the help of the world and that they would appreciate that message being taken. But what I understood from that moment is they were seizing their own destiny. In every aspect of our society, we are moving from the rigid, hierarchical top-down to one that is more flat, more flexible, and accessible. New technology has given voice to those who are voiceless. On that border, I received Twitter messages from people trapped in places in Libya without food. Those coordinates were passed on to our emergency structures. My leadership job today is not so much about telling what people what to do. It is more about knowing how to tap into and guide the creativity and talent toward a bigger vision. Think of the leaders who have impressed you throughout history, the Rosa Parks, the Nelson Mandela's. They did not need Twitter or Tulip Revolution to teach them this. None of them was the boss, but they all led right from where they are. The second I would like to point out is the trait that I find the most valuable in the work I do, to be a problem solver. The late John Gardner, the former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare under President Johnson, said, quote, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as insoluble problems. It is said that in any given situation, any group of people, 90% will be following, 5% will be detracting, and 5% will be leaders. Faced with a challenge or obstacle, a true leader will turn that challenge into an opportunity. We are seeing this in our own work at the World Food Program, where we've instructed our leaders on the ground to take chronic cases of dependency and change them. And our team in Cameroon decided rather than passing out food aid, they would invest it and put it into many food banks in 300 villages working with women leadership groups there. Today, those food banks where people can borrow food during the lean season and return it during harvest with about uh, like a 3% uh, addition has broken the cycle of boom and bust hunger for the first time in decades or ever. And guess what? Last year I didn't have to bring food aid there, nor the year before. These new ideas that come from the bottom up are really changing the face of the type of work that we do. The third is the necessity to act without perfect knowledge. Nobel Prize laureate and U early UN Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld said, quote, it is when we all play safe that we create a world of utmost insecurity. It is when we all play safe that fatality will lead us to our doom. It is in the dark shade of courage alone that the spell can be broken. True leaders must act. In this rapidly evolving information age, sometimes it's just as much a problem dealing with too much information rather than not enough. A leader must be able to gather information quickly, prioritize it, and then act. Then it is critical to have the feedback loop to correct course quickly and decisively. In Haiti, WFP worked with an international network of crisis mappers who leveraged their combined power of social networks, such as Twitter, mobile phones, and mapping technology, enabling citizens to help themselves in disaster. These are the new models. The fourth I would mention is be passionately curious, ask questions, and then ask more questions. I always say there are only three important things to know. Where are we today? Where do we need to go to? And how do we get there? This can apply to your own life, as well as to ending such issues such as world hunger. 
One of the most dangerous attitudes that I see is when people feel they have to prove how smart they are. I've sat in critical meetings where I think this is driven more, not so much by arrogance, as an almost premortal fear of revealing ignorance or not knowing it all. Perhaps because of my reporter training, I just ask a lot of questions. And I'm never afraid to reveal my ignorance, and I think this is a powerful way to learn. I went to a village in Pakistan during the high-level panel on how effective the UN is, and the UN had invested much money in this post-earthquake village, and yet people weren't using the services. So I said, let me gather the women, and I sat down with them, and I said, if you had a magic wand and could have one wish, what would it be? And all the women shouted out at the same time, our buffalo. We want our buffalo. And it turns out during the earthquake, the village lost its only buffalo, which was the source of all the food for the nursing mothers and the new babies. And so a big health facility was built with all sorts of equipment and pharmaceuticals and everything to help them, but they just wanted their buffalo. It's how they knew how to manage their problem. It turns out it would cost $1,000 for that buffalo. And when I mentioned this in a speech in Washington, people contributed the money and that buffalo went up there, and the women now are back to doing that. But we have to ask and we have to be able to listen. So please keep asking questions. The fifth is also to, convent, to question the conventional wisdom. As Admiral Rickover said, all new ideas begin in a non-conforming mind that questions some tenet of conventional wisdom. At the World Food Program, I have banned the words, that is not the way we do things. My favorite quote is by Einstein, who says, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. It is very critical for our institutions and those you will work with to main, remain relevant that we ask, how do we operate in a world that's changing? How do we change what we do to get different results? One of my most important books in my life is by Clayton Christensen of Harvard. It's called The Innovator's Dilemma, Why new When New Technologies Cause Great Firms to Fail. And it tells the story of the ICE company in North uh, East United States that didn't pay attention when refrigeration came in and then found out one day they had no business left and it collapsed or why IBM didn't create the PC, or why the PC didn't create Google, or why Google didn't create Twitter. Why is it that when new technologies come in, you can't adapt these, these uh, big firms? And for the World Food Program, where we used to bring a bag of food to solve every hunger problem, today we're delivering in 30 countries digital food. I will just hold this up. This is now the face of food aid in many countries where there's food on the shelves, but people can't afford the food. And people can take this card and swipe it at a store and get locally produced food. And it gives these little shops businesses. It gives the farmers business. I have to say, I sat in a meeting with my very creative young team who came to me and said, let's deliver digital food. And I said, I'm sorry, how does food pop out of a phone? but I had to be willing to reveal that ignorance. But these transformations now are defining the world, and I know it is the place you're comfortable, and please bring that with you where you're going. And the sixth I will mention is plan and strategize, but make it flexible and modular. Sun Tzu said, quote, tactics without strategy are the noise before defeat. And today in the world, I know we have some military here, we see a lot of ready, fire, aim. 
It's very important we know where we're headed, even when things are changing very quickly. But what we have found is you have to keep your strategies flexible. No five-year plans, no 20-year plans. You have to adapt quickly. And in fact, some days at WFP, we're adapting by the hour, given the food crisis and the changes in the world. And finally, be opportunistic. Benjamin Disraeli said, the secret of success in life is for men to be ready for his opportunity when it comes, and women. Leaders recognize the unique window of opportunity before them and respond accordingly. The ancient Greeks had a word to capture this, kairos, meaning the opportune moment. The Greeks believed that such an opportunity had to be grasped, otherwise the moment would be gone forever. So be proactive in creating your opportunities. If there's one single piece of advice I would offer you, it is this. Don't choose a job, choose to work with a great leader. Find mentors. My career has ranged across many pillars, but the choices I made were based on the opportunity to work with someone who could teach me how to lead in the world and how to expand my mind and opportunity. When Paul Nietzsche was asked in an interview by the American Academy of Achievement about all the contributions he had made during his career, his laconic reply was the following, quote, I have been around at a time when important things needed to be done. This was a man who had the foresight to conclude that a massive aid program would be necessary to avert an international financial crisis, recognizing the unique opportunity with the Marshall Plan. Well, all of you graduate today at a time when something important needs to be done. It is the same type of era that Paul needs to faced when he dreamed of this institution. Get in the closest proximity you can to a leader you admire. Study them, take initiative, lead from the bottom, treat all with respect, kindness, and as a potential source of brilliance. The rest I know will follow. Ray Kurzweil, a futurist and inventor of disruptive technologies, was quoted in Time Magazine at the end of last year saying, quote, we are the species that goes beyond our limitations we didn't stay on the ground. We didn't stay on the planet. Our species always transcends. Lead, transcend, graduate, celebrate. I look forward to collaborating with all of you on the front lines of today's biggest challenges. For today, you have become something very esteemed. You have become a SICE graduate. Congratulations. Thank you for that timely and inspiring speech. And I think the class now knows what's coming because I see them moving up. The class of 2011, the time has come that you've worked so hard for. Dean Wilson, will you please come to the podium to introduce the SICE graduates of 2011, who will then um, get our congratulations. Thank you. It is my pleasure to present the candidates for the Master of Arts degree. Yasuyuki Abe. Scott Abrahams. Alicia Adkins. Natalia Ivasova. Mesam Ali. 
Claire Allenson. Rebecca Aman. Adrian Atkinson. Sarah Austrin Willis. Hamy Bahar. Caldwell Bailey. <clears throat> Annalisa Ribeiro Bala. Jason Ballot. Jessica Bartos. Melissa Bask. Sarah Beeler. Lynn Bechtol. Veronica Belenkaya. Alexis Belo. Kristen Baird. Purna Bhattacharji. Susanna Baum Langford. Christina Borisova. Nicholas Borst. Thomas Bowen. Christopher Brandt. Ellen Bray. Natalie Breen. Ryan Breyer. Benjamin Bryan. Megan Berland. Bradley Bush. Stephen Bayef. Geoffroy Caillou. Luca Cavallini. Edgar Chavez Sanchez. Warawut Shawinkiat. Kathleen Chekin. Sheena Chong. Cordelia Chestnut. Bhavna Chilakuri. <laughs> Tiffany Chow. <laughs> Peter Crystallite. <laughs> Neil Christensen. <laughs> Ki Hoon Chung. Leanne Clark. Spencer Clark. Bo Cleland. Lauren Cohen. Catherine Cooley. Robert Cowden. Whitney Cox. Elia Cusimano. Daniel Cutherell. 
Laurence Delesquay. Jean-Pierre Deroux. Tiffany Denman. Tommaso Dercole. Emily Deutschman. Izumi Divalier. Lena Diesing. Stephen Doyle. Maylie Dozier. Stephanie Ader. Elizabeth Eisman. Paul Elliott. Hayat Esakati. Alison Fagens Turner. Patrick Falwell. Sarah Farnham. Orofisola Fasehun. Dana Fassler. Andrew Fennell. Iris Ferguson. Eva Festel. Nikolai Filchev. Nicole Ferment. Patrick Flanagan. George Fleeson. Ashley Fletcher. Flesher. Sina Fosgard. Devin Foxel. Sebastian Fox. <laughs> Meredith Gaffney. <laughs> Stellina Galitopoulou. <laughs> Benjamin Gadan. <laughs> Inoa Gong. Charles Gillig. Karen Grabner. Catherine Grau. Emily Greenhall Stammer. Mitko Grigorov. Jared Guajardo. <laughs> Roxana Paula Guevara. <laughs> Matthew Hale. <laughs> Kristen Handley. <laughs> Catriona Hanks. <laughs> Miles Hansen. Nathan Hansen. Mark Hansen. Danisa Hans. Catherine Hardeman. Elizabeth Harrington. Allison Hart. Yeah.
Catherine Harvey. <laughs> Sean Healy. Stephen Heidenheim. Brianna Held. Sarah Hexter. Bartley Higgins. Liesel Himmelberger. Liana Hinch. Fabio Hirschhorn. Travis Hobbs. Isabel Hoffman. Joshua Holland. Jana Hongla. Dennis Hood. Evan Hume. Vasilena Ivanova. Allison Jacobs. Carrie Jackson. Marioline Janmat. Patui Girat. Young Ji Jo. Kara Jones. Noreen Kabir. Theodore Khan. George Kalansakis. Joan Cato. Daniel Katz. Steve Kosick. Rebecca Keller. Jahan Khalili. Solmaz Korsand. Doc Kwon Kim. Jane Kim. Mi Jong Kim Regina Kim Su Jin Kim Su Cook Kim Su Wan Kim Juliana Knapp. Tanya Konidaris. Maria Copetta. Stamatis Kotuzas. Yeta Krasnice. Kinga Crisco, <laughs> Lindsay LaForge, <laughs> Stephanie Lambert, <laughs> Alexander Lanfried, <laughs> Mary Langan. Amber 
Latner. Eric Lee. Jenny Lee. Tatia Lemonjava. David Leonard. James Lurch. Jessica Leslie. Yimian Lee. Kira Lichter. David Lighton. Jenny Lynn. Alison Lindenberg. Lisa Lindgren. Rebecca Lipsky. Christopher Leo. Myung Jin Liu. Nicholas Lizop. Stephanie Locatelli. Kara Lafaro. Arif Lokandwala. Jared Lomaster. Sophie Liu. Philip Lustenberger. Robert Lyons. Erica Magayan. Robin Mack. Layla Mamadli. Ponciano Manalo. Julia Manhen. Noah Mann. Anthony Mansell. Lani Marsden. Antonio Martinez. Todd Martinez. Mihoko Matsubara. Sina Maxfield. Alyssa Mayer. Darren McAnelly. Roger McCarver. Peter McConaughey. Jeannie McDonnell. Emily McLeod. Emily McCray. Andrew Moe. Emily Mendrela. Maximilian Meron. Sarah Mercadante. Karen Miller. 
Sanan Mirzaev, <laughs> Valerie Mock, <laughs> Arta Moini, <laughs> Sarah Morgenstern, <laughs> Goezde Morkach. Chris Morrill, <laughs> Catherine Morris, <laughs> Sebastien Morvan, <laughs> Ruth Mower, <laughs> Amina Mukhtar. Kumiko Murata, Michael Nakagaki, Ryoko Nakano, Sharon Nakimovsky, Dina Nawas. Naoko Nemoto, Zim Nguyen, Joshua Nickel, Gunta Niparte, Monica Nonjevic. Elizabeth Norris, Elizabeth Notides, Marguerite Novak, Margaret O'Connor, Atieno Oduor. Julia Oliver, <laughs> Raquel Oreas Tagaro, <laughs> Brian Orland, <laughs> Eje Oschelik, <laughs> James Pay. Daniel Palazov, Kristen Pappas, Jason Park, Niraj Patel, Shao Shao Pang. Eric Pearson, Paul Peters, Jean Francois Perronard, Kirsten Pfeiffer, Stephen Phillips. Shiva Polevka, <laughs> Elena Ponieva, <laughs> Jason Patel, <laughs> John Proben, <laughs> Shana Ramdarshan. Elizabeth Resch, Thomas Rickers, Salina Rico,
Marcel Ricou. Connor Riggs. Vienna Robinson. Ranieri Rodriguez. Alicia Romano. Theodros Roux. Meredith Ryder Rood. Awidya Santikajaya. Maria Savchuk. Valentina Savioli. Julia Schiff. Julia Schilling. Daniel Schneiderman. Vincent Scheck. Tilo Schroter. Davide Shiliuzzo. Stephen Seabrook. Monica Sendor. Dahaya Su. Caroline Seifert. Jamie Schellenberger. Sophie Schulman. Ravi Singh. Alexander Skinner. Edward Slavis. Michael Smith. Van Smith. Matthew Solenberger. Jung Hua Song. Jared Sorrento. Mario Soto. Christopher Southwick. Sarah Sparker. Boyan Stanoeth. Michael Stanton Geddes. Moran Stern. Meredith Street. Monica Stajarowska. Karen Tang. Ahab Tofik. Sarah Taylor. Antonio Timoner Salba. Taylor Tinney. Joaquina Tolbert.
Michaela Tregilio. <laughs> Lindsay Tronsru. <laughs> Robert Van Aerd. <laughs> Angela Venucci. <laughs> Brian Vasek. Karina Veras, Bastian Ferenc, Stefan Witwitzki, Timo von Königsmark. Abby Wakefield. <laughs> Eshrat Warris. <laughs> Mia Warner. <laughs> Catherine Weber. <laughs> Andrew Whitworth. Lindsay Wilner, James Wilson, Tina Wong, Suyon Shu, Aaron Young. Braden Young, Wallace Yu, Sarah Yoon, Selma Zahirovich, Alfredo Zarati. Luan Jo, <laughs> Kenneth Zoller, <laughs> now it is my pleasure to present the candidates for the degree of Master of International Public Policy. Spencer Abrazizi. <laughs> Caroline Adenberger. <laughs> Niels Annen. <laughs> Jihan Askar. Andras Bacinodje, <laughs> Michael Bailey, <laughs> Richard Bew, <laughs> Maribel Cheris, <laughs> Puja. Churamani, Shane Corcoran, David Diamond, Aurora Fleming, Diantha Garms. Lisa Hansen, Kurt Harris, 
Manaz Harrison. Alfredo Idiarte. Seiya Ishikawa. Dave Kidney. Quinton Kuhlman. Katarina Lasandrich. Kyle Markram. Ethan McAfee. Ian McConnell. Scott McLearn. Rene Magella. Andrew Moore O'Farrell. Edgardo Mosquera. John Pacheco. Tony Padilla. Janelle Poldi. Michael Ponchak. Christopher Rapp. Jeremy Reyes. Ashley Rogers. Niethi Shah. Raj Srinivasan. Michael Taylor. William Torrey. Ali Reza Vaezadeh. Maria Cecilia Viegas. Carolyn Ward. Carmencita Wonder. Kalita Woods. And now it is my pleasure to present the candidates for the highest degree awarded, the Doctor of Philosophy. I will give their names and the titles of their dissertations. Janie Shea, China's Role in UN Sanctions and the Implications for the International System. States Alignment Choices, a comparative study of Malaysia and Singapore's hedging behavior in the face of a rising China. <laughs> Ellen 
Sykus, Building State Failure in Timor-Leste, Patterns of Political Competition and Constraints to Private Sector Development, 1999 to 2006. Mariano Turzi, The Political Economy of Soybean Production in Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. Michael Vickers, The Structure of Military Revolutions. Thank you, Dean Wilson, and the faculty who joins me in congratulating all of you on a job well done. And now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce John Harrington, the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, who will be presenting the Student Awards. Good afternoon. The Christian A. Herter Award was established by the friends and associates of the school's co-founder, Christian A. Herter. This award for distinguished academic performance is presented in honor of the person whose vision and inspiration have encouraged generations of young people to perform effectively with skill and statementship in the international arena. The Herder Award is given to the student in the second year class with the highest grade point average for the first three semesters. This year, there are two recipients of the Herder Award, and they are Izumi Devalier and Tard Martinez. Izumi and Tard, would you please come to the podium to receive your awards? Congratulations to the two of them. The Herder Award is given for scholarship. The most important component of the next award, the William C. Foster Award, is service to SICE in the community. The certificate reads, quote, for sound scholarship and a record of leadership and distinguished service to SICE, exemplary of the high qualities, integrity, loyalty, and ability admired by Mr. Foster. This prize honors the former director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, distinguished businessman, tireless public servant, and devoted SICE Advisory Council member." End of quote. The student receiving the Forest Award was selected for significant contributions to SICE and the community. The recipient of the award is Evan Hume. Evan, Evan is also a first-rate student. Evan, please come to the podium. And Dean Wilson will introduce the members of the student government. In recognition of their dedication and hard work, we would like to acknowledge the members of this year's Student Government Association and give them each a small token of our appreciation. 
Would you please come to the podium as I call your name? Sean Healy, President. Meredith Gaffney, Vice President. <laughs> Jana Hongla, Treasurer. Catherine Cooley, Bologna representative. <laughs> Jason Patel, social chair. <laughs> Jeremy Reyes. MIPP representative. <laughs> and now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Sean Healy and the great SICE class of 2011. Sean. Thank you, Dean. When I look at the, group, at the group of people assembled before me, I see the most eclectic and diverse group of individuals I've had the pleasure of meeting. We come from a variety of places and have an array of interests. I'm proud to say that in my time at SICE, I was surrounded by a group of doers, achievers, dreamers, leaders, teachers, and travelers. And when I take my next vacation or business trip, wherever in the world that might be, there's a 99% chance I'll either be sleeping on the couch of a fellow SICER or having dinner together after a day of meetings. My favorite part about this school is that the SICE family extends around the world. Wherever you end up, you know that a friend is only an email or a phone call away. As a family, we take care of one another. When we lost a fellow student, Julia Bachleitner, in a senseless tragedy last September, students supported one another, just like a family should. And, as a, and collectively, we honored her memory by establishing a memorial fellowship in her name. I'm proud to say that we reached our goal of raising $40,000 for this fellowship. In short, thus ensuring that future generations of Sicers can, conti can continue Julia's work in the areas of peace and justice for those in conflict zones. I thank you for your generosity and ask you to join me in a moment of silence to remember Julia. Thank you. Aside from our fellow students, the SICE faculty also plays a critical role during this transformative period of our lives. As educators, mentors, and career advisors, they impart their wisdom, knowledge, and experience to us. The Max M. Fisher Prize for Excellence in Teaching gives students the opportunity to show their appreciation to a professor who has made a difference. This year's recipient was my first professor at SICE during the preterm su summer session. He's charismatic, engaging, always available to students, and has the ability to simplify the concepts of economics so that anyone can understand them, all the hallmarks of an effective SICE educator. And if you were lucky, he might have just made uh, an appearance at your underground party <laughs> at our house. <laughs> uh, thus proving that he's truly, uh, truly connected to the student body. It's my honor and privilege to announce the 2011 Max M. Fisher Prize for Excellence in Teaching, Professor Matthias Matisse. Congratulations. What a great class. <laughs> I have a confession to make. Graduation is actually my least favorite day of the year. You know why? I know it sounds corny and all, 
But all of you are going to go out into the wider world and do great things, actually applying your international economics training and whatever regional or functional concentration you focused on here. And we, at this side of the podium, will still be here <laughs> at SAIS, waiting for a new class to come in in August. Think about it. I have to start teaching supply and demand all over again. <laughs> and so the cycle repeats itself every year. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you so much for this awesome recognition. A senior colleague at the Bologna Center always reminded me of the importance of students to a university. Without a student, he said, there would be no university in the first place. Students make it possible for us to do all this great research, and all we have to do is return some of that knowledge to them. And he is absolutely right. And I, perhaps more than anyone, know that it is the diversity and intelligence of our student body that makes SAIS the best graduate school in international relations in the world. There, I said it. After all, as most of you know, I am a SAIS grad myself. <laughs> so it has been an absolute pleasure to teach here. And I have a special bond with this class, the class of 2011. I had so many of you, the DC students in class during preterm in August 2009, torturing you every morning or every afternoon with four weeks of microeconomics. And close to 100 people in Bologna took my international crate theory course while I was in Italy in the spring last year in 2010. And honestly, can we say it again, with talented students like all of you, teaching is a real pleasure. And if you think about it, all economics is basically about decisions we face every day. Trade-offs, maximizing satisfaction with the inevitable constraints we all know too well. However, if there is one thing I want you to remember from my classes, it is to always be critical and to be aware for the rest of your lives of the inherent dangers in linear thinking. Things that go up too fast must eventually come down, as they know in Wall Street. And be wary of the one-liners of the pundits and the wonks, especially in a city like this one. If you can avoid dogma and apply that size multidisciplinary spirit to your professional careers, we, at this side of the podium, will all have succeeded. There are so many people I would like to thank or love to thank and mention in person here, but I do not want to take away any more time than necessary from Annalisa. So let me thank all the deans, the faculty and the staff, both in Washington DC and Bologna, who have been so helpful over the years because they make SAI such a fantastic place to work. But if you allow me, let me single out just a few. Academic Dean John Harrington here took a chance on a 25-year-old kid seven years ago, asking me to teach my first class in economics. I also want to thank my two program directors, Charles Doran and Gordon Bodner. But it has been an absolute pleasure for me to be surrounded by such an incredibly talented, energetic, and young faculty in the International Economics Department all of whom have been such wonderful colleagues. The Econ Department at SAIS in many ways is exemplary for the rest of the school. Given its vibrant and cutting-edge research agenda, weekly research seminars, and a wide range of course offerings. And of course, one last big thank you to all of the program's army of incredible teaching assistants, or TAs, many of whom are graduating here today. Adrian Atkinson, Atkinson, um, Becca Keller, Bhavna Chilakuri, Isabel Hoffman, Marcel Ricou, Paddy Flanagan in Bologna, 
and of course, Neil Shanai and Greg Fuller here in DC. Bravo. But let me finish by saying that there is not a day that I don't look forward to getting up and going to work. And yes, that is true even in hot, hazy, and humid August here in DC during preterm. And that is really a feeling I truly wish for all of you as you go out into the world to your life after size. So thank you again so much for this great recognition and all the best in your future careers. Thank you again, Matthias, for all your hard work. Before we depart this room and start on the next chapter of our lives, we will hear from a member of the graduating class. She is an international student from South Africa. Please welcome the 2011 class speaker, Annalisa Ribeiro Bala. I was nine years old when I first read about Dr. Martin Luther King. I was too young to have heard about him in the classroom. South Africa in the late 1980s didn't have a curriculum on the civil rights movement in the U US. If you know anything about South Africa's history, you'd understand why. So what I knew about Dr. King was largely self-taught. Prompted by a quote I read from his letter from a Birmingham jail. We are all caught, he wrote, in an inescapable network of mutuality. Martin Luther King wrote that letter in 1963. I read it in 1990. I remember it because that was the year former President Nelson Mandela was released from jail. So what does this have to do with you? When I first joined the program at SAIS, initially all I saw were the differences between us. Different accents, different cultures, very different backgrounds. But it didn't take long for me to recognize the network of mutuality between us, because as much as you're individuals, SAIS students do have a profile. Here's what I know you all have in common. One, you're adaptable. This was evident in Bologna. Perhaps for the Europeans it was an easy transition, but I was amazed at how quickly we caught on to the rules. No coffee with milk after 10 a.m., gelato at least three times a week, if not every day, and no going home in the evenings without meeting for aperitivo, espresso at Julio's, or late night philosophizing at Humphreys. In DC, you've been equally adept at playing chameleon. I've seen you flit from class to an internship to any number of networking opportunities, transitioning from student to young professional with a quick change of shoes. Be it Mexico, Brazil, France, you've always been able to fit right in. Two, you're by no means ordinary. It occurred to me walking past a blue gorilla at this year's Halloween party, <laughs> that we're all a little peculiar. It's obvious we know how to have fun. We're amenable to just about anything that involves drinking and dressing up, or not wearing very much at all, as we saw at our recent Mr. and Miss Size contest. We've made full use of our happy hours, thanks in part to our size bands and DJs, have cooked and dressed in remembrance of our heritage, have celebrated any number of holidays, St. Patrick's Day included, and have gone glitz at both the Vienna and Cherry Blossom balls. But that isn't what makes you unusual. It's that you're so gutsy. You've lived and worked in multiple countries, have a number of degrees to your name, speak at least two languages, have been in Peace Corps, have led or been a part of any number of clubs. Best of all, you're earnest. 
I've seen you plan with precision the route for taking down your enemy on the paintball course, be it Ida versus Strat or Sice versus Georgetown. I've seen you at the crisis simulation assume the role of president or minister, very convincingly negotiating an exchange of nukes with Russia, or convening a pan-African summit to discuss the water crisis. Whatever you set your mind on, you do it with heart. Does this mean you'll get a job? <laughs> Given all the tools you've been equipped with, I think the answer to that question is relatively obvious. You've received an outstanding education and have had multiple opportunities to polish your CV. Trips to the Middle East, China, Eastern Europe, South America, funding for internships abroad, exposure to a variety of academics, practitioners, and policymakers in the classroom and through SICE's lecture series. You've been prodded by professors to think analytically, steered by career services to figure out what it is you do best and where to invest your time. SICE has given you the platform. The real challenge is figuring out how to launch into your life. The measure of success will be different for each of you. For some, it will be the day you become president. For others, the day you start your own company, get the promotion you want, or the day you choose to start a family. Whatever the moment, and however you use your education, my hope is that you will draw on that network of mutuality around you and be guided by what in South Africa we would call Ubuntu, the recognition that you are who you are because of other people. It's unfortunate, but it's often only when we've known loss that we realize how deeply dependent we are on one another. Generosity is unquestionably another of your attributes. The response to the crisis in Haiti, the concern for your fellow classmates who have family in Japan, these all show your big heartedness. But my perception of you changed when we lost our friend and classmate, Julia. All of you, even those who didn't know her, gave what you could, even if that only meant giving a hug to those of us who did know her or contributing to her fellowship. That is community. You have a responsibility to widen that community. And regardless of whether or not you recognized for it, to share your hard-earned wisdom. We really are living in incredible times. We have choices and opportunities, access to information our parents could never have dreamed of. But for all the massive knowledge we've accumulated, despite the spread of technology, life is not easier. At least not for those who do not have the skills and education we've been fortunate to receive. The world is still governed by inequality. It took one man, one sacrifice, and a network to set off a wave of revolution in the Middle East. How much more can you achieve? You may not start a revolution, but you have the capability and resources to make the world a little more sustainable, a little more diverse, a little more educated, and a lot more human. Thank you for the friendships and memories. I'll carry them in my heart. I wish you success and happiness. I think from our keynote speaker to our class speaker, we heard a wonderful theme which really resonates at SICE. And so now, sincere congratulations to all of you who graduated today. And before Mr. Nelson closes our program, 
I would like to invite the graduates and their guests to the reception at the NHTSA building at 1740 Massachusetts Avenue Northwest. We all look forward to seeing you there. Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Dean Einhorn. Ladies and gentlemen, I will ask that you remain seated until the faculty and the class of 2011 have exited hall. Ladies and gentlemen, the faculty will exit first. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2011 graduating class of the Paul H. Nitsi School have advanced international studies.